I mean, where do we begin other than what is going on in this nation? Mm. Conflagrations everywhere. And a government, frankly, that to me aren't just... To me, two days ago, they were useless and inactive. Mm. Now, I think they're frankly dangerous. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say good morning, um, (laughs) Alex, but it really doesn't feel a good morning, actually. It feels like these are dark days for our country, actually. And you think of the world watching us at the moment, and they are. Yeah. I tuned in a little bit. You were listening to the Today programme. I was uh, tuning in just to some of the... Uh, did a little Google search and saw what, like, for example, Australia, America, mm. Germany was watching. And they are watching us. Mm. And it looks like we're a country out of control, not at peace. And I think that is obviously part of the truth. It's not the full truth. We're a country of 70 million people, and most pe- most towns and communities in Britain are at peace. Yeah. But, it's, but this disorder, this thuggery, this horror is far too widespread. And the government, as you say, haven't got a grip. We are now, what, the second... We're entering about the second week of Mm. this. And it doesn't feel like it's getting better, Um, even though it's cooler. Some people were blaming the heat last week. It's certainly a contributory factor. Oh, that'll be it, won't it? It's got a bit sunny, so we all went out on a rampage. Um, But, you know, it's it's really, really bad. And I'm afraid this... This sense that there is one law for certain people and another law for others is gaining currency. And when you have a Home Office minister like Jess Phillips seeming somehow to excuse some of the Muslim gatherings we saw yesterday in Birmingham, that feeling is only going to get worse. Well, you know, I said the other day when Sir Keir Starmer came out for the second time and used the term far-right thuggery, that whatever his intention was uh, from using those particular words, and I think, actually, he absolutely believes that this is what is going on, mm. uh, which I disagree with. We can talk about that a bit later. But whatever his intention was using that form of words, to me, it further alienates and angers the mobs going out and kicking in shop windows. Mm. But it also adds to the sort of burning sense of injustice, the indignation, the self-righteous rage Mm. that is now propelling more Muslims onto the streets to fight against their perceived threat. Doesn't help anyone. It's actually essentially been an accelerant. Mm. And my problem with this, and why I said I think the Labour government aren't just inactive but frankly dangerous, is they are still not willing to talk about the causes, only the symptoms, and this, even the labelling of what are the symptoms are totally wrong, in, in, in my opinion. And to me, when you use the term far right, it is a political term, and, you know, these are people with manifestos and matching shirts and, you know, mm. organisations. That This isn't what's going on here. Mm. This isn't some sort of neo-political party trying to take over this country by force and violence. These are hooligans and thugs Mm. who, frankly, would, you know, kick a shop window in if their football team doesn't win. Mm. Are they organised? Well, they might have a few channels on Telegram, but, frankly, no. They're people who are just... I think I'd push back a bit on that, actually, Alex. I think there is a level of organisation here. I think there are groups, there are people who follow certain rabble-rousers on Twitter and other forms of social media. And I think, you know, the police are intercepting, you know, vans of people going from one town to another, causing up trouble. So I think, you know, there are a lot of genuine people out there who are genuinely angry. They should be locked up Mm. for their behaviour. But also I think there are people who are transporting around the country, like the football hooligans that you absolutely mentioned, the kind of people that will go to football match after football match, weekend after weekend, causing trouble. I think there is that happening too. There is a degree of... uh, organization let's yeah. say light coordination but when i talk about organized i mean in terms of a sophisticated organization that i don't think although some is... of it, i think we talked about this on where well, you raised it last friday there is that international dimension that may be a little bit more organized well actually. exactly yeah. absolutely no mm. the fact that there's no doubt foreign hands and bot farms uh, yeah. who are trying to augment and accelerate the mm. troubles we <clears throat> are facing right now But it seems to me what is quite clear, as somebody who has worked in various countries of Africa, especially during election periods where Mm. there's constantly a threat of post-election violence, this isn't racism either. This is the sort of beginnings of an ethno-conflict. And the reason I say that is if this was racism, there'd have been protests when Rishi Sunak became prime minister. If this was racism, those mobs who are kicking in shop windows would not sort of be cheering on uh, half of the England football team during the World Cup. It's not that. What this is about 
is that at a time when everybody's resources feel extremely stretched, mm -hmm. where you don't have integrated communities that cooperate, but instead mm -hmm. feel like they're in competition, when cultures are so alienated from one another that they don't share languages or values, then it becomes very easy to become suspectful of each other, distrustful of each other. That's been going on a long yeah. time. As soon as one particular uh, ethnic group, let's say, which, like I say, ethnicity is not to do with skin colour. People often confuse this. When they suddenly feel under threat mm -hmm. and they feel persecuted in some way, this is usually, to me, the match that is struck yep. and lit the blue touch paper. And this has happened both, I think, subversively through being told constantly that Britain is awful, Britain is evil, there's white privilege, our culture's wrong, our history is yeah. to blame. When you've got all of these sort of, you know, race baiters popping up mm. all the time on, you know, mainstream television channels, looking for racism everywhere, pointing yeah. the finger of blame at working class white people all the time, that's been very corrosive. Yeah. And then finally what we see is attacks on what look demonstrably to be white people, Mm -hmm. Whether it's a soldier, whether it's a group of, you know, little girls at a dance class. On that roundabout in Birmingham last night. Right. Mm. And so this is what has created this conflagration. It mm. isn't necessarily racism. No. It is not a far-right political movement with a manifesto. This is a lack of integration and mm. warring communities and tensions straining for, for, for decades now, frankly. Yeah. Um, um, and I, and I, no I, government's addressing this. Can I add one other big thing as well? I agree with everything you've mm. said. There's a report by the Centre for Social Justice think tank I'm associated Great with today. Tank. Yeah, thank you. Um, and it talks about six million people being behind in their council tax. Right. Now, this is another illustration of the financial strain that a lot of communities are on. Some people don't pay their council mm. tax for bad reasons, but there are a lot of people who just can't afford to pay the bills at the moment, whether it's their electricity bills or their council tax bills. There are multiple causes for why certain communities in Britain feel as unhappy as they do. Mm. And I think we have both agreed, we both can constantly condemn the violence, we're not excusing no. what is happening. But it should be said, and I think this is a big issue, we had a wake-up call in the 2011 riots that we didn't act upon. There are 10 to 15 percent of the British population, a demoralised, detached working class who feel completely remote from the rest of the country. Mm. Some are white working class, some are from Islamic communities. But they are absolutely dependent on welfare. They're, a lot of their family structure has broken down. The sense of virtue has broken down. They never have a hope of really a proper integration in society. Yeah. And we as a society, because we're rich enough, we can afford to pay the welfare bills. We can afford to police them. But they are basically not part of the rest no, of the country cut off. in any way. And we don't really care enough because we can police and we can manage them to actually transform this situation. No, I agree. But one moment after another, maybe this, you know, maybe in a week or so, the riots we're seeing at the moment will die down and we'll all go back right. to our lives. Well, but the next time this erupts, yeah. in next year or two, it'll be bigger again. It will be, and, and when what? at some point will we ever face up to the fact right. that there is this section of society yeah. that we are parking, but we are monitoring with the political and we're not class. living with? There is no social mobility in this country and the political class don't just ignore that lot. Yeah. The left behind has been termed as... Um, during the Brexit campaign. They don't just ignore them, mm. they sneer at them. Yep. They are revolted by them. Yep. They hate them. They would will them out of existence and those people mm. know that. Yeah. They know that they are despised by the people mm. who sit in the Palace of yeah. Westminster. And that to me is utterly, utterly heartbreaking. But by giving them benefits as well, we're not really caring for them. No. We're really not. There we, is no we, dignity we think, in sitting think, at home, no. scraping by on a handout. And, and we haven't fulfilled our responsibilities as neighbours by just paying the money. And the problem we have as well is a lot of the things that have driven policy making in recent decades, that drive the agenda in NGOs, that drive the agenda uh, on television with the editors of newspapers very often, which it seems to be driving the agenda of successive governments, is the middle class concerns. It's the middle class is ruling for the middle class classes and you know what they can say we meet, must open our doors mm. to lots of people from the developing world because they come from awful countries and we are a wealthy nation yeah. well they can think that when they own a detached house yeah. when they've got the latest car when they can go on a foreign holiday and leave the cares of the world behind yeah. when their children go to a good school and yeah. have hopes of brilliant careers they can think that there's plenty to go around mm. but 
actually the resources aren't coming from them. No. It's a scrabble for resources, like you said, at the bottom end. Yeah. And, it, and it's those it's communities who are then impacted when the migrant yeah. hotels are occupied. Yeah. When it's actually worse than you say, actually, because actually a lot of those middle class people benefit from the cheap labour they, being exactly. imported. You know, their, their hotel rooms are cleaned by the clears, their homes yes. are cleaned by the clears, they have people who do the manual labour around their house more cheaply. Yeah. But and actually, the streets, people at the bottom, they don't have jobs right. because of these immigrants. Their streets are tidy and nice, and when they meet people from other countries, they will be educated people who mm. share our values. They will be people who have come over here to work as doctors, mm. who have come over here to work at the BBC. And so they'll look at these people and say, they're just like us, they're wonderful. Mm. I love the fact that they can teach me about their cuisine and their home nation. Well, actually, what we have is a load of people here who have come over, never learnt the language at all, yeah. not for generations, have never thrown away their passports yeah. from back home, who sit at home and read the news from back at home, listen mm. to radio stations, television channels, speak in their own language, and when they get on airplane they're going back home mm. they're an economic unit but they're not a member of our society yeah. and this is why we have these problems and you know what I am afraid that I can't see any indication that anybody in the Labour Party gets this at all in fact they're continuing to do what caused this in the first place by pointing their fingers at the working classes and mm. saying it's somehow their fault and you know whose fault it is it's yours Alex. Of course and it's mine. mine. Uh, we're but, disseminating but, all this because, hatred. Because by drawing attention to the problem, apparently that's worse than the problem itself. But exactly. So, drawing attention so, uh, to it is not going to make it go back under the carpet. Talking about the failure to integrate is worse than the mass immigration but, you, and the failure to integrate. I want to talk about that, actually, yeah. because, you know, I found myself for the very first time yesterday feeling like every word I heard I had to sort of quietly self-edit. Yeah. There was something funny. I've got a knot in my stomach yeah. at the moment of what can I say and how far can I, you know, talk yeah. what I see to be the truth. Both because I don't want suddenly clips to be circulated online that will inflame the situation. Mm. I am a sensible, moral person, and the last thing I want mm. are, are saying words that are going to encourage people, people like to that. go out with that righteous yeah. indignation. Mm. But also because it seems to me the approach of this government is information control. It is narrative control. It is shutting people up instead of addressing the problem. And when I see a number of people, left-wingers, and the sorts of things they're mm. writing online, they would use this as an excuse yeah. to it's basically not, lock people like you and I up. Uh, it's not just government, I'm sure you agree. I don't know if you saw a clip on Sunday from the BBC. There was um, Kevin Hurley, the uh, former police uh, inspector, superintendent, he was just talking about, he said, well, we have to see these riots in the context of other events that have happened. It's not just Southport. He mentioned Leeds and he mentioned the stabbing of the soldier. Mm, oh, the police uh, officer. Yeah. And they've and, got to go. And, got and, and go, they, go, they immediately yeah. said, no, you can't talk about that. That's in yeah. conflating situations. He said, you can't... Um, understand these without understanding the why and they stopped him yes. they cut him off and they said no you're making the problem worse but now this so is when the, people what watch a mainstream broadcast yeah. do that what happens people think BBC is not allowing conversation it's not yeah. letting the truth and what they go off is then they go to the wilder extremes of the internet where they are fed very damaging and incendiary information yes. so it really is important it sounds like we're um being very uh, blowing our smoke up our own whatever's at the moment but um <laughs> talk and other platforms where the where conversation really flows freely where you don't feel you have to constantly self-censor mm. is incredibly important. I mean actually the Labour Party would do a lot of good by sitting down and listening to talk and hearing when people call yeah. in and discuss their problems because our audience are not knuckle-dragging Neanderthals they're intelligent they're astute they're kind-hearted they're and, good people and anxious and, and very scared yeah. um, and well I think we all have much reason <laughs> to be scared at the moment